Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's keynote presentation, Proteogenomics and Cancer Biology, Insights for Prognosis and Therapy, presented by Dr. Karen Rodlin, Director and Professor, Biological Sciences Division, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I am Xavier Gutierrez of Labrits, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. Labroots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will, re will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rodlin. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you for attending uh, this seminar. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to explain you the new field of proteogenomics and how it can be applied to cancer biology to produce new insights for prognosis and therapy. The first question is, why proteogenomics? Why add proteins to genomic information? Well, part of the answer is that if you look at tumors, they're characterized by a very large number of genomic changes. You can see these uh, figures from the TCGA uh, flagship papers on ovarian and glioblastomic cancers. And you can see that there are many, many uh, somatic copy number variations in these tumors. The question is, which of these are important? Which of these genome level changes are actually driving the phenotype of cancer? So our hypothesis was that if you actually looked at protein expression in addition to mRNA expression and genome level changes, you would be able to identify those things that were functionally important and really driving the malignant behavior. This work was published two years ago in Cell. The visual abstract is on this slide as well. So our first target was ovarian cancer. And you might ask why ovarian cancer? Well, ovarian cancer is truly a disease of chromosomal instability. The Cancer Genome Atlas found nine recurrent mutations, none of which was dominant other than P53, 113 focal copy number aberrations, and over 168 promoter methylations. So it's a real problem to tease out which of these are important. The other crucial issue with ovarian cancer is that it has a really horrible survival if it's not discovered until stage three, four. The, the five-year survival rate is less than 30%, but it's 90 to 95% if it's detected in stage one or two. Problem is ovarian cancer is asymptomatic, so most women are diagnosed with stage three, four. So anything that we can do to understand the response to therapy or improve the early detection of this disease will improve the quality of life for these women. So I'm also going to talk to you about a consortium, the Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium, which took on the task of adding protein level measurements to the genome level measurements of the Cancer Genome Atlas characterization of ovarian cancer. And so we partnered with Johns Hopkins University to do this analysis on 84 tumor samples, 32 of which were done jointly at both institutions. Now, it's no fun to do a proteomics or a mass spec experiment unless you have a question to ask, unless you're trying to compare two different states. Otherwise, you're just stamp collecting. But the prognosis in ovarian cancer is so horrible that it was easy to go into the survival data that TCGA had on these women and select two different cohorts, those that had really poor clinical outcomes and died in less than 1,000 days called these the short survivors, and those women who had very good clinical outcomes and survived for greater than four years, we called these the long survivors. And we were very interested in the proteogenomic characteristics that distinguish between these two behaviors because we would like to be able to treat the short survivors more aggressively with non-standard treatment. So 
the emphasis in, in our approach is on information flow. And we've all seen the central dogma of molecular biology, that you start with DNA and you transcribe it into RNA, and then the RNA is translated into protein, and protein does the work. But now we all know it's not as simple as that. We have replication of DNA. We have reverse transcription of RNA to make DNA. We have epigenetic changes to DNA that are mediated by proteins that actually determine which genes are turned on or off. And we have RNA that's self-excising and that has enzymatic activity. So it's really much more complicated than we thought. So the question is, what should we actually measure? Should we measure the DNA sequence, mRNA abundance, protein abundance, or protein activity? And we tried to measure all of these. So what did we actually measure in this study? We measured copy number variations. We measured DNA methylation. We measured transcription by both microarray technologies and RNA-seq. We did limited proteomics and TCGA with reverse phase protein arrays. And we also did microRNAs. And we had clinical metadata related to the initial diagnosis, the follow-up diagnosis, and overall survival. So the basic plan was to integrate all these pieces of information, look for correlations between the DNA level changes, the mRNA, the protein, the phosphopeptides as well, then do functional enrichment of the results and come up with functional insights as to what was going on. We had a very large data set to start with. We had over 3,000 proteins, almost 30,000 copy number variations, and over 3,000 mRNA transcripts. So this is an example of how adding the protein information really helped identify those copy number variations that had the greatest impact on the phenotype of the disease. So the figure on the left shows a correlation between protein abundance and copy number at a particular locus on all 22 chromosomes. And um, I'm going to use my pointer to illustrate things. The red diagonal is the effects in cis. So if there was an amplification of gene number at that locus, there is also an increase in protein abundance. If there was a deletion at that locus, there is also a decrease in protein abundance. And we see a very nice cis effects. Which of those are important? Here we have the vertical effects where we saw proteins on other chromosomes that increased in abundance when there was an amplification or decreased in abundance when there was a deletion. We call these trans effects, and they're a particular gene locus acting at a distance on other genes usually through the induction of transcription factors or signaling pathways. The interesting thing is that there was a lot of proteins that were identified with this analysis, and that made it difficult if you looked at a protein level to understand what was going on. But when we rolled it up to biological processes, we saw that there was a selection for transregulated proteins that were associated with proliferation, with motility invasion, or with immune regulation. And these are three of the 10 hallmarks of cancer. So it's basically showing that in ovarian cancer, out of all the different ways you could make a malignant cell, there is a real emphasis on proliferation, motility invasion, and immune regulation. And these observations have held up even in a completely independent respective set of samples. The other advantage of using protein level functional information is that it has more information content. So the slide on the left is an analysis of survival by transcriptomic subtype and by proteomic subtype. They pretty much agreed, although we found a new protein level subtype that we named the stromal subtype, but it was present in only a small number of patients, only five. That one subtype looked like it had poor survival compared to the other four too small to really tell statistically, but you don't see any strong trends uh, jumping out at you at the clustering level. However, when we took the signatures that we got from the trans-affected proteins and trained them on the survival data for the patients, we came up with a machine learning generated signature that had a very high statistical power for determining between long survivors and short survivors. And this trend held up in prospective analyses. So functional um, relationships are also very strong in terms of 
controlling the association between mRNA transcription and mRNA translation into proteins. When we did a correlation of mRNA levels to protein levels, we found a wide range of correlation coefficients for the same gene at the mRNA level and the protein level in the same tumor. And they grouped by functional uh, importance. So those gene products that were associated with metabolism, with amino acid metabolism, nucleic acid metabolism, and immune regulation were very tightly correlated between mRNA and protein. But those functions that were really housekeeping functions, like ribosome production and splicing of RNAs, those proteins appear to be made in G2, and they just hang around, and there's very little correlation between the protein and the mRNA. So this is just an illustration experimentally, again, of one of the observations from the cell cycle that we've known for decades. So function analysis works. It gives us more information. And what is different about functional analysis? It really is a focus on pathways. So the whole hypothesis was that by focusing on pathways, we would gain more information into what is working in a tumor. And I have a nice little analogy that I like to present. And I'm drawing an analogy to the routes for air traffic for an airline. How do you get from San Francisco to New York? Well, the first slide here shows you a map of all the air routes in the US for United Airlines. All the different ways you can get on a United Airlines carrier and get from one side of the country to the other side of the country. That, my friends, is the genome of the airline. However, on any given day, not every route is being used at any given time. That is the transcriptome, the proteome of the airline. What is actually happening? I call it the fossil proteome of the airline. Which airline airplanes are actually moving from San Francisco to New York and on what route? And this is the fossil proteome of the airline in health on a normal day. I happened to be thinking about this when winter storm Jonas struck the East Coast. You can see the radar, the, the nasty snowstorm on the East Coast. And this is a disease state for the airline business. You can't get to New York. Notice not only do we not have flights going to New York, but we've disrupted and changed the balance of information flow to Chicago and to Dallas-Fort Worth. There are far fewer planes going to Chicago because they can't connect to the East Coast. There are far more planes going to Dallas, Fort Worth, and Denver. So the point here is that the disease process is not a one gene, one protein process. It disrupts the entire flow of information in the cell. And we wanted to capitalize on this by studying the phosphoproteome. And so we looked at the relative ab abundance of phosphorylation on the same protein in short survivors and long survivors. So we normalized the amount of phosphorylation to the abundance of the protein. If we called something upregulated in phosphorylation, there were more phosphorylation events per molecule of protein, and not a simple increase in the number of protein molecules, which had the same degree of phosphorylation. And when we did this analysis, we could see that there was a distinct increase in phosphorylation all whole in the short survivors compared to the long survivors. But if we did an enrichment analysis for the top most highly phosphorylated pathways, we came up with a short list of pathways that you can see here, PDGF receptor beta, the VEG receptor, um, some cytokine receptors, RAC, which is associated with motility. And you can see that increased phosphorylation in these pathways clusters with survival so that the short surviving patients had much higher levels of activity in these particular um, pathways. When we did the combination and the integration of RNA, protein, and phosphoprotein data to try to look at all different dimensions of what's going on in the cell, we can see that phosphoproteomics really contained the most information. So the figure on the right is a picture of the PDGFR beta pathway that came out as one of the very top upregulated pathways. And the little red arrows are the statistically significant upregulated events. And we have mRNA protein and phosphoprotein here. 
And you can see that by and large, the significant changes are at the level of phosphorylation. The figure on the left shows this with the purple bars, which are the most upregulated pathways at the phosphopeptide level. And you can see that we had far more upregulated pathways identified by phosphorylation than by proteomics or by transcriptomics, although they did correlate when we had both measures. Now, you might ask the question, well, why look at, why do this globally? Why take the time and effort to look at every protein and every phosphoprotein? Why not you just use RPPA, reverse phase, protein arrays, or other antibody-based methods as TCJ did originally? Well, this is a comparison of the results from the TCJ samples with the RPPA assay and with global comprehensive phosphoproteomics. So the two results are very congruent. Those proteins that were on the RPPA assay behaved the same in, in that regard as they did with global fossil proteomics. But you can see how much more information content we had with the global analysis and how we were able to not only see STAT and MEC and ERC, but we were also able to fill in the gaps and see that the main input to these pathways was the, the PDGF receptor, not the EGF receptor, not the MET receptor, not the insulin growth factor receptor, but the TGFR beta receptor. This is very important now if you want to develop a therapeutic to go after this pathway, because you need to know how many nodes are truly involved so you can target the right nodes. So the next application for proteogenomics is really precision medicine. It's taking this information and using it to guide therapy of the patient. So the classic model, if I can use classic for something that's only been around for five years, but the standard incarnation of precision medicine is to start with preclinical data, throw it into some kind of an analytical engine, some kind of artificial intelligence neural network, grind and bind type of, of uh, analysis, and come up with treatment recommendations for your patients. So it relies very heavily on actionable mutations in vitro phenotyping, and thus it does have some limitations. The major limitation of targeted therapies is that right now they're dependent on an actionable mutation, and there are only a handful of mutations that have drugs that have been approved by the FDA, VRAF, NRAS, ALK, ABL, other tyrosine kinases, homologous repair deficiencies as in BRCA1-2 mutations, and then the production of neoantigens for immunotherapy and vaccination against the cancer. So there's only a subset of all patients who can even be treated with targeted therapies. The second limitation is that the initial response rate is very high, but so is the recurrence rate. Almost all tumors develop resistance. And if you have multiple mutations in the same patient, how do you know which one to target? How do you intelligently design combination therapies? So we wanted to tackle all three of these problems with a global proteomic and fossil proteomic approach and expand the types of preclinical data that are fed into the engine. So this is a collaboration with Brian Draper at the Knight Cancer Institute, and they are specializing in smart treatments or serial measurements of molecular and architectural responses to therapy. So they're taking in a very large number of preclinical data types, mutations, protein subtypes, histological images, functional screens in vitro, transcriptional signatures, pathway activity, immunophenotyping, and in vivo models. And they're trying to come up with a therapeutic recommendation for their patients in uh, acute myeloid leukemia, prostate cancer, and breast cancer. What we're uh, advocating is that you add mass spectrometry-based proteomics to the mix, and you do global proteomics and fossil proteomics. So what are the advantages of adding proteogenomics to precision medicine trials? It's really a truly personalized approach that's driven not only by the patient's genome, but also by their phenome, which includes the epigenetics, the protein translation turnover, and uh, environmental impacts on that person as well. It adds a direct measurement of pathway activity in terms of both protein abundance and phosphorylation. The deep coverage from a global approach enables identification of interactions and crosstalk between pathways, which can help guide combination therapies, and it provides information on post-transcriptional regulation. So again, we were 
grateful to be funded by the National Cancer Institute's Proteogenomic Translational Research Centers program. And this was designed to take the proteogenomic advances um, with archived specimens and apply them to clinical questions. And we had preclinical arms for, where we discovered what were the key proteins that would provide information about targeted therapies. And then that information would be applied in a clinical arm integrated with actual, honest to goodness, FDA approved clinical trials in order to actually see whether we could make a difference in patient outcomes by including proteogenomic data. So the one that I'm involved with is the Pacific Northwest National Lab, Oregon Health Sciences University, Collaboration for Acute Myeloid Leukemia. And the objective of this one was to determine whether we could use the baseline proteome and phosphoproteome in AML patients to predict the drug response of the patient. And we started using AML cell lines to validate, moved on to validate the signatures in primary patient samples. And we want eventually to predict the uh, response of the patient samples to drug response and also predict the response of clinical patients using specimens from trial subjects. So at this point, we only have preliminary data to report. Um, this is one of the first experiments that was done on established cell lines, each one of which has a different driving mutation, a very well-known different driving mutation. So K562 cells have the BCR able fusion. You can see that they're very highly phosphorylated in downstream substrates of the ABLE kinase. MOM14 is a FLT3 ITD mutation. It's known to be responsive to serafinib, and it's very highly upregulated in um, proteins that are associated with proliferation and with immune response. THP1, which is driven by a RAS mutation, is also upregulated somewhat in immune response genes, but it's very highly upregulated in proliferation-associated genes. And so this is at the global level and at the fossil proteome level. One of the questions was, can we actually identify known substrates of the driver mutation? And can we see the expected change in the activity in the phosphorylation of those substrates using fossil proteome data? This is a reality check for the specificity of our approach. And we can see here that looking in the K562 cells with BCR able fusion, shown in, in this bar, that known able substrates were very highly phosphorylated, much, much more so than the same able substrates in the MOM14 and the THP1 cells that lacked the BCR able fusion. So again, this shows the power of a global fossil proteomic approach to identify specific pathway activation events. So our next uh, objective was to look at the dynamic response of these cell lines to drug treatment. So treatment with drugs that we that the cell lines were known to be sensitive to. The satinib for the BCR able fusion, serafinib for the FLT3 mutation, trimetinib for RAS activation. We add a fourth cell line with a JAK3 mutation and we treated that cell line with roxolitinib. We measured the response at baseline 30 minutes after treatment, three hours after treatment, and 16 hours after treatment. And we did both total protein and phosphor protein. And here are the initial results. You can see that each one of the four cell lines had a different re uh, temporal response to their drug treatment. But in general, we saw pretty rapid responses at 30 minutes that would intensify over the first three hours. And then we would see a kind of a return to baseline 16 hours after drug treatment. Some, in some cases, we actually saw a decrease in, in some phosphorylation events early on, an increase at three hours, and a further increase at 16 hours. So it would be very interesting to look at the temporal response of, say, the JAK3 pathway compared to BCR able activity. But one of the very promising um, aspects of this experiment in terms of clinical application is that we probably get the most information that we need out of this first half hour treatment. So one can imagine a day where you would take a sample from the patient, treat it ex vivo for 30 minutes, harvest the cells, process the proteins, send them to the mass spec, and get an answer the same day or the next day as to which targeted therapy you should use for that person. 
rather than having to wait days for an in vitro culture assay. So that is our ultimate goal, to add proteomics to clinical trial design. So this is just a flow chart for two um, NCI-funded clinical trials in AML that we have um, piggybacked onto. And basically, these trials started with baseline proteomics and fossil proteomics of uh, patient samples who were then treated with inhibitors, and they were followed over time. If they if the tumor responded to therapy, fine. The patient was kept on that therapy. But if the tumor did not respond or if the tumor recurred, then there was an iterative analysis of mRNA protein and phosphoprotein to come up with the next line of therapy. So we added proteomics to these trials. So as the first step in doing this, we used actual AML patient samples that had full uh, whole exome sequencing data and full RNA-seq data. And we analyzed the baseline phosphoproteomics and phospho pro and proteomic profile of these patient samples at baseline from frozen cell pellets without any treatment. And we got some very interesting results, as you can see in this preliminary data. The blue boxes indicate the driving mutation for each patient. And you can see that there was no real clustering by mutation. They're pretty well spread out. The red boxes indicate drug response. And we can see that the patients clustered very tightly by drug responsiveness, particularly responsiveness to the same drugs. So that is very promising information that we will be able to use phosphoproteomics as a um, prognostic tool, a theranostic tool, to help identify lines of therapy for these women. So we've been doing some parallel experiments to uh, explore the specificity and the power of this approach. One of these uh, studies was done with picritinib, a novel small molecule inhibitor uh, of multiple kinases but that are relevant to AML. But in particular, it was shown to be a very strong inhibitor with a very uh, low IC50 for IRAC1, a tyrosine kinase that is known to be responsive to IL-1 and to uh, toll-related ligands, and therefore an immune system-related ligand. So we went on to do dose-response studies uh, of pacritinib, and uh, our collaborator, Anapriya Agarwal, um, was able to classify the patient's samples based on pacritinib sensitivity from highly sensitive patients on the left to highly resistant patients on the right. We performed phosphoproteomic analysis on the same AML samples and saw interesting clusters of high levels of phosphorylation on particular proteins in patients that were sensitive to pacritinib, whereas a different set of proteins showed elevated phosphorylation in patients who were resistant to pacritinib. We did further analysis of the phosphopeptide motif that was highly phosphorylated in the resistant patients or the sensitive patients and uncovered some novel motifs which may be associated with drug responsiveness in these patients. We went on to look at a specific substrate, substrate the P38 MAP kinase, and again found that sensitive patients showed an increase in phosphorylation of P38 MAP kinase, whereas resistant patients showed decreased levels of P38 phosphorylation. So again, we think that this approach is going to be very uh, productive going forward for identifying therapies. Now, but what, is, what do you do if your patient has multiple mutations? How do you combine drugs in a way that makes sense for the patient who has more than one genomic mutation? Well, the classic way so far, and it's actually not classic, it's a very innovative approach that came out of Brian Drucker's lab and Jeff Tyner's lab. And what they have done is taken the patient samples and cultured them ex vivo in, in 96 volt plates and treated them with various drugs and looked at the survival of the cell lines in culture and determined an IC50, um, an inhibitory concentration at which 50% of the cells died. And they have been able to calculate an index for death uh, for a single drug treatment and also an index for combined drug treatments. And they were looking for synergy where the combined drug treatments were greater than one. 
So you get very complicated data sets out of that. You get this kind of matrix of interactions between drugs and patients. And it's very hard to look at a matrix like that to me and really decide what combination of drugs to give to the patient. So instead, we went for the pathway approach again, the mechanistic approach where you measure the pathways uh, directly and fit them into known curated pathway maps. And, um, and so we are uh, going to be applying this approach in actual clinical trials of drug combinations that are currently underway using um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors and um, a um, bromodamine 4 inhibitor. So the take home message from these studies is very simple. Genome level predictions can be detected, identified, and measured at the protein level. So the central dogma holds up and you can verify which genome level changes are actually being expressed in the patient's phenotype and therefore likely to have a functional impact. The trans effects of copy number variations of protein abundance are very interesting and actually can be used to infer the mechanistic drivers of cancer and of survival in that particular patient. Combining all sorts of data from the, from the central dogma, proteome data, transcriptome data, and genomic data facilitates the identification of robust subnetworks that can be associated with disease outcome and can be used to predict the best targeted therapy for that patient and improve clinical outcomes. So I want to thank you for your attention and I want to really say thank you to the teams who have worked with me on this project. Proteogenomics is extremely a team sport. Um, not only are we teaming genes, transcripts, and proteins, but we're teaming folks at PNNL, Oregon Health Sciences University, and at the National Cancer Institute that funded this work. So thank you very much for your attention and I will be glad to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Rodland, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. Now let's get started. Our first question is, what additional information do you get from mass spectro spectrometry based proteomics compared to other platforms like RPPA? Well, if I can go back in my slide presentation and show you that particular figure here. I think it's really obvious that you get more information about um, all of the various components of a signaling pathway. When you use RPPA or um, O-Link or Somalogic or any other affinity reagent based method, uh, you get very exquisite sensitive information about known targets, but you're only able to ask questions about the known knowns. With global proteomics and global fossil proteomics, you get to ask questions about the unknown unknowns or, and find out what you did not know. And so this can be very important if you have non-standard interactions between pathways, um, it could be very important in understanding the pathways of drug resistance, because if you shut down one pathway with a drug inhibitor, what other pathways in the cell are being upregulated to convey the same information from the extracellular environment to the nucleus? And in order to get that type of uh, crosstalk information, you really need to be seeing all the adapter proteins and all the nodes that interconnect between pathways. And what other PTMs have you measured besides protein phosphorylation? So we're currently measuring protein acetylation, um, and we can also measure protein ubiquinylation. There are other labs who have uh, specialized quite highly in measuring protein glycosylation, which is really important in how the immune system sees proteins. Um, variations in protein glycosylation can trigger autoimmune responses. It's not an expertise of PNNL, but it is an expertise of Johns Hopkins, our partner in the ovarian cancer study. There are also some innovative um, proposals going on to measure oxidative damage uh, to proteins. They leave what are called redox markers on the proteins, and we are experimentally developing techniques for looking for redox damage markers on proteins. 
And how much sample do you need for mass spec analysis? It is much more than you need for nucleic acid analysis because uh, you have PCR and other amplification methods. And the antibody-based methods are exquisitely sensitive and can get by with um, just a with 50 micrograms or less of protein and less than 20 milligrams of starting material. Uh, 20 milligrams is an absolute minimum for us. We really like to have hundreds of milligrams of uh, starting material. And that is a limitation if you're dealing with biopsy samples or if you're dealing with precious archive samples. We're gonna have time for one more question. Uh, do you think mass spec based proteomics will ever be used clinically? Yes, I do. Um, I know that right now it's an experimental technology that the instruments are very expensive and very um, intricate and complicated and that it really takes an experienced operator to get reliable reproducible results. But that's the state of the art today. Taking that condition and converting it into a simplified mass spec that does one thing and does it well and does it in a standard automated way such that a med tech type person can be trained to do it reliably and reproducibly is an engineering problem. It's not a fundamental problem. So if we come up with the assays that have clinical utility, then there will be the driver to make the mass spec clinic friendly. And I think we'll see a day when the mass spec is just Well, I would like to once again thank Dr. Rodlin for her presentation, and I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January of 2019. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.